Today we're going to be talking about something very close to my heart, how to make the perfect cup of English tea. Now I'll be consulting a couple of key documents here that you'll find in the links below. Those are George Orwell's pivotal 1946 article to the Evening Standard, entitled A Nice Cup of Tea, and the Royal Society of Chemistry's paper on how to make the perfect cup of tea. Yes, we do take our tea rather seriously. Okay, so we've got our essentials for making a fantastic cup of tea here. We've got our kettle, we've got a teapot, we've got a tea strainer, we've got a mug. Some people would say you need a cup and saucer, but those people are liars. We've got some milk, and we've got our tea. I'm using a loose leaf blend from Fortnum & Mason. Now the terms used for tea are often quite confusing. But the time at which British people tend to drink tea often tells you about what the blend is made of. So, in, first thing in the morning, it's expected that British people need a rich malty brew to get them out of bed and doing their daily business. So you tend to find that breakfast blends are heavy on Assam tea, which is that full malty flavour. Later on into the afternoon, that's when you tend to get the lighter teas like Darjeeling mixed in as well. So the first thing we're going to do is boil the water. Thus, and then we're going to warm the pot. Now, depending on who you listen to, there are different mechanisms for warming the pot. The simplest and easiest is to swill the pot out with water. And if you're using a metal teapot like me, that's absolutely fine. In fact, I always only do that. If you read the Royal Society of Chemistry paper, then they suggest you put your teapot in the microwave to really ensure that the outside is warm as well. Obviously don't do that if you've got a metal teapot. So, having successfully boiled our water, we're going to warm the pot. I'm also going to throw away a few old tea bags that seem to have lingered in here from this morning. Now, the Royal Society of Chemistry recommends that you use a minimum of a quarter full. Very scientific, excuse me. Once we've got our lovely warm pot, we're going to add the tea. And once again, we jump into yet another controversial debating point. Now, loose leaf tea has more room to move around in the pot, and arguably that gives a fuller flavour. It doesn't, of course, because the reality is that with a tea bag, you could just leave the tea bag longer. But here's where the science kicks in. The tannin in the tea, which is what gives it its astringency, it's what gives it that lovely dried mouth flavour that makes you kind of purse your lips and go, mmm. And for me, it's part of what makes tea so magically refreshing. Tannin is a large molecule and takes time to seep into the water. The longer you steep the tea, the more tannin is in it, and therefore the more bitter the tea. Which isn't to say you can't make a great cup of tea with tea bags, but you just have to get the timing exactly right. With loose leaf tea, you can leave it between three and five minutes. With a tea bag, you need to catch it at about the six minute point, or it's going to start tasting a little too astringent to be pleasant. Now the old adage is one teaspoon per person who's drinking the tea and one for the pot, or one per cup and one for the pot. If you don't know how big your pot is in terms of how many cups of tea it makes, just measure them out. So I'm gonna time this for four minutes, starting now. So our four minutes is almost up. I'm gonna start thinking about the milk and that just gives me a minute to talk to you again because once more, this is where things get unexpectedly controversial. The should you add the milk first or the tea first debate has been raging on for years and years. And there's a number of historical reasons and misconceptions behind the order in which you add them that no longer particularly apply. For example, once upon a time, fine bone china was incredibly hard to make, and therefore extremely expensive. So the common people added their milk first, so they say, to protect the china. By extension, therefore, being able to put the tea in the cup first showed that you were of sufficient high quality to afford the finest of china, and it became associated with good breeding that you would put the tea in first. George Orwell, too, advocates putting in the tea first, but he gives an entirely practical reason that you may best regulate the exact amount of milk you want in a brew if you haven't already added milk to it. Now that's the same logic in the royal household. The queen has her tea served to her with the tea in first, but it's purely so that she herself can dictate the amount of milk that she wants in her tea, as the royal livery would never presume to do that for her. 
Chemically, however, and this is supported by that Royal Society of Chemistry paper that we keep on about, it's better to add the milk first, and there's a clear scientific reason behind that. It's a question of whether or not you want to create an emulsion or a solution. The fatty proteins in the milk are going to be slightly denatured if you add them into a large concentration of hot water, which is going to lead to just a slightly thinner brew, in the same way that UHT milk has so much thinner a taste than full cream milk. It's because all the proteins have been denatured by high temperature sterilization. So if you like a thicker, more creamy cup of tea, you should definitely add the milk first. If you're set on adding the milk afterwards, you should always use a pot because by the time your tea has brewed, your water will have cooled to below 75 degrees Celsius, which is the temperature above which we start to be worried about those milk lipids. Milk in first. You don't need a milk jug, of course. I just drink a lot of tea. Now, as to whether or not you need to add milk at all, that's entirely according to taste. Tea strainer, not an essential item, but otherwise you'll have a cup of tea leaves. Now, if you're like my grandmother, you'll just chew them up, but uh, personally, I prefer not to. And look at that lovely colour on that. Assam tea being malty is going to create a more golden colour anyway, so don't be too fooled by those rules about checking the colour, because if you're drinking tea made primarily with something lighter, it's going to make a lighter tea anyway. But that is beautiful looking. Mmm. And that for me really is the perfect cup of English tea.